Laura, are you all right to come and join me? Thank you. I don't know if you're going to get blinded there. Can we? Ah, Luke's got the air. Perfect. There we are. Laura, it's possible there are people here who don't know you. There are a few visitors tonight. Your mic needs to be quite close to your mouth to pick up on Zoom at the back, just so you know. Uh, for those that have never met you before, introduce yourself, family, and what you do. Hi, everyone. So for those that haven't met me, my name's Lara. Um, I've been at Headley Park Church now for a couple of years. Are you um, on, Laura? Can I just check? Testing. Ah, oh, there you are on. We're Can on now. Me? That's good. Yeah. Maybe I need to hold it closer. Um, yeah, so I'm married to Chris and we've got four wonderful children uh, and I work as an A&E doctor, so pretty transferable skills with parenting four kids, I'd say. Um, so I'm not, I'm not in any way an expert on depression, um, but day to day in my job, I do see people most days who have tried to commit suicide and it's part of my job to help them through that. Uh, so I think that's partly why um, Neil has asked me to come to talk to you today. It is. So Laura's got expertise that I don't have and just... In two Sundays, what well, it's two Sundays time, isn't it? We're doing Thanksgiving for two of your it children. Is, yeah, on the 27th. So yeah, if you're around that day, then uh, we're going to have a Thanksgiving service for two of the children because the pandemic got in the way of doing it any sooner. So it's exciting. So yeah, we will see the children then and see Laura again then. Laura, I've got four questions. You know what's coming? Yes, I do. So uh, I want to know medically, just in case we wonder, what, what is depression and how is it different to just feeling a bit down? Yeah, sure. So um, depression essentially is a mental health problem um, that's characterized by a persistent low mood uh, and a really a loss of interest in day to day doing things and uh, a loss of enjoyment in doing things. But it's really the key is a persistence. So it's got to be more than two weeks. And quite often there are other symptoms uh, that go along with it. Uh, and they can be different for different people. Um, but things like a change in appetite, a change in weight, uh, sleep can be affected by it. Um, thoughts of suicide, self-harm, uh, um, yeah, different things like that. Okay, so it's persistent and it's all of those things that you've described. So just a few days wouldn't really count. It's a bit, it's prolonged. No, yeah. and I think, you know, it's normal to experience some of these things after a, a life event where um, we experience a period of sadness or bereavement, but it's the key really is the persistence um, and really a, an inability to shake that off after a while. Okay, so if... If you're trying to recognize this in yourself or in others, um, yeah, how, how would you begin to start saying, okay, I think my friend might be depressed or I might be depressed. How would you kind of self-diagnose or help someone else to yeah, call for help question. if they need it? I think there are two useful questions that you can ask in that, uh, in that situation. So the first is looking back over the last month, how have I often been bothered by feeling down? And uh, the second question is, over, looking back really over the last month, have I often uh, had times where I'm, I, I've had a loss of interest in doing things, I've got no enjoyment in doing anything? And if the answer to those two questions is yes, it is worth probably booking an appointment with a GP to, to talk it through with them. Okay, so I come to you, hopefully not in A&E, but I, let's imagine I, I, you know, I come to you and I'm really worried. Um, I think a lot of people wonder what's going to happen in that consultation when they go. Um, what sort of things would happen if I walked through the door? So I just came to you and said, look, um, Dr. Jenner, I think I might be, you know, I think I might be depressed. I've been feeling really low recently. H how would that then play out? What, what would happen? Yeah, certainly. I think um, if you if you were to go to see a GP or took a friend to see a GP, the first thing they're going to do is to ask you questions about what's been going on, what's what's led to the consultation, um, what you've been experiencing over the last month, um, and in particular, any particular feelings that you've had and physical symptoms as well. They'll ask uh, specific questions about symptoms that you've been getting. Um, they'll also ask about a family history of mental mental health problems. Um, and then they would examine, do a physical examination, really just to check that there's no physical cause for what's been going on. Uh, and then they might well then follow up, follow up that with a blood test to, to rule out other causes for, uh, for what, what you've been experiencing. That's really helpful. Thank you. And I think a lot of us fear when I talk to people in the church that we're automatically going to get put on medication. 
Um, is that the case? If you go in and you, would that happen? No, absolutely not. I think the first thing is um, the GP is going to try and distinguish, is this a period of sadness that you're going through? Is this a physical health problem that needs to be treated in a completely different way? And it's just that you're experiencing these symptoms actually as a result of a physical health problem. Um, and if those things are excluded and depression is diagnosed, uh, then there are a range of treatment op options available. And actually, usually they tend to start with lifestyle changes is there are some uh, therapies and uh, psychological therapies that can be tried first uh, and then medication might be considered after that and even then there's a range of different medications and it would never just be started uh, without a discussion with um, with the patient it's always a case of um, coming to an agreement about what is best for that person yeah uh I guess, sorry, this is a fifth question that I've thought uh -oh. of now. You guess <laughs> we're now off script. This is always going to happen. I mean, I've seen medication be really effective for a large number of my friends at different times in their lives. Um, is medication always for life? How long do courses tend to last? No, absolutely not. And, I, and that will completely depend on the person. So some people may well have a period of medication and then come off it and then be okay. Some people might go on medication and it, it's not that good and they might change the medication um, or try something else for a while. Um, and some people, it may well be for years that they're on it, uh, but then they're very stable on it for years and actually things are, are greatly improved on it. So it really, really does depend on the person and, the, and each individual situation. Thank you. Has anyone got any immediate questions in the light of what Laura's just said that you've been wondering about? Anything you'd like to ask you think would generally be helpful for people? I mean, yes, Sharon. That's a good question, actually, and it can be. I don't I'll just the repeat the question just for those listening at home. Sorry, it gives you a moment's thinking time as well. The question was how likely is depression to be passed down through the generations? So depression actually can run in families, and that's one of the reasons why a GP would ask you about family history of mental health problems, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be. So, you know, each person is different, um, and just because it is in the family, it doesn't mean it's going to be carried down, but certainly there is more likelihood in a family where, where it is present. That's helpful, thank you, Sharon. Any other questions at this stage? Thank you. I think it's worth, you can hang on to the mic if you want to. I don't think you're going to need it again, but just in case. Um, it's worth saying that in this church, we are in favor always of people seeing their GP. If you feel that you might be able to get help that way. We often tend to be really nervous when it comes to mental health issues in a way that you wouldn't be if you broke your leg. If you fell over and broke your leg, you probably don't feel any sort of stigma in going to the doctor. But what I've observed in 20 years of pastoral ministry is most people feel like they've failed. Most people feel like they should be doing better. Most people feel they should be able to pick themselves up off the floor and just carry on. And it is utter nonsense. We live in a world where our bodies break and our minds also break. And where we, can we, we cannot just fix ourselves by trying harder. Most of the people I know who've had depression are extremely determined people. They're often very successful, and it's just a period of their lives where things have just gone wrong and they need help because their health has failed. It's why it's called mental health. Is it, which, I think we're getting better as a society talking about it, but I think as Christians, there's actually a book written called I Shouldn't Feel This Way. You know, we just feel like we shouldn't, don't we? Rejoice in the Lord always. Let's just keep dropping glib verses on. You know, God's in control of all things. God is good. And we know these things are true, but we don't feel them when we're feeling depressed. They're hard for us to believe. And sometimes, this, often, if you need to have a conversation with a doctor, do it. If you want someone to come with you, ask someone in this church to come with you. You know, we, we can do better together than we can apart. You know, I've sat through GP's appointments with people before. I'm sure it will happen again. Because sometimes it's just useful to have someone else listening. Someone else who loves you. Someone who's in your corner. Someone who can remind you of things that you might have forgotten. So thanks so much to you, Laura. If people got questions afterwards you didn't want to ask them for, you'd be around for a few minutes afterwards. And there are others here who are medical as well. If we, we can talk. We've got, we've got help on hand. So yeah, do chat with Laura afterwards if, um, if you've got questions you weren't able to ask just then. 
And we're going to look now at the scriptures. So um, let's turn to Psalm 88 together, and then I'll pray afterwards, I think. Psalms are right in the middle of your Bible. I don't know the page number yet. We'll get there in a minute. Uh, Psalm 88 is on page 597, 597. So Psalm 88, page 597. It's definitely going to help you to have this open. If you've never read it before, it's going to be a shock. All right, just brace yourselves. Uh, it's an unusual psalm, to say the least. Psalm 88, a song. Psalm of the sons, a psalm of the sons of Korah, for the director of music. And there's a couple of musical terms there that no one knows exactly what they mean. And there's a masculine, again, a few guesses to what that means. But we know who wrote it. Him and the Etherite. And his psalm is, this is his only psalm. So it's one contribution to the book out of the 150 is this. Didn't write any others. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. I'm set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You've put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I, I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I've suffered and been close to death. I've borne your terrors and I'm in despair. Your wrath has swept over me and your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. It's a I find that really hard hymn to sing, but it's true, isn't it? So true. Well, get your Bibles open. Let's have a look at Psalm 88. I chose it because it's the bleakest psalm out of the whole 150. Um, only two psalms end on a complete downer, and this is one of them. Uh, darkness is my closest friend actually more literally my closest friend is darkness the final word in the hebrew deliberately is darkness and the only other psalm that ends on a downer is psalm 39 which ends with these words hear my prayer lord listen to my cry for help do not be deaf to my weeping i dwell with you as a foreigner a stranger as all my ancestors were look away from me that I may enjoy life again before I depart and am no more. And that's unusual in the Psalms. Normally, they end at some point on a statement of trust and faith and resolution and boldness to kind of carry on. Well, not those two, and particularly not this one. Uh, you, if you've been around the church for a while, we, you'll know we've looked at Psalms of Lament. About a third of the Psalms are sad songs. Um, but they usually follow a pattern. Step one, the psalmist turns to God and kind of brings the problem to him. And then step two, they list their complaints. So they'll say what they think is wrong with their life or with the world. And then the third thing they'll do is they'll make requests. They'll say, God, put this right. And then fourthly, they'll often choose to trust God. That's, that's the usual pattern of lament. But when you find this psalm, it doesn't follow all of those steps. It begins with the psalmist turning to God. Did you see that? The first word there is Lord. He cries out to the Lord 
you are the God who saves me day and night. I cry out to you. So it does turn to the Lord. But then basically the rest of the psalm is complaint. Did you notice that? So uh, he just complains. I'm overwhelmed with troubles. My life draws near to death. Verse three, verse four, I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. Verse five, I'm set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You've put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Think he's finished? He hasn't. He's carrying on complaining. Your wrath lies heavy on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've taken from me my closest friends, and you've made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. My eyes are full with grief. And he hasn't finished. Even the questions there aren't really questions. We'll come back to those in a mo. But he's got more complaining to do. Um, verse 13, but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? For my youth, I've suffered and been close to death. I've borne your terrors and I'm in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they've surrounded me like a flood. They've completely engulfed me. You've taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. It is a series of complaints. And even the questions are not bold requests. Basically, the psalmist, when he asks the questions in verses 10, 11, and 12, is basically getting up in God's face. He's basically saying to God, I know better than you do. You have made such a mess of my life. I don't have a clue anymore what you're doing. Are you trying to finish me off? Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction, or your wonders known in the place of darkness, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? What do you know, God? What do you know? And there is no final statement of trust. In the end, he says, darkness is my closest friend. What he's actually saying there is, in this moment, in my life, darkness is a better friend to me than you are, God. You have let me down so badly, so many times, even just the rest of sleep. Those moments when I close my eyes and I drift away are a better friend to me than you are. So what are we to make of a psalm like this? The Bible's not full of them, but there is one of them, and it's there for a reason. Three things it's there to show us with some why is it in the Bible? Three things we're going to consider. So most of the time on the first point, so don't worry, um, the next two are much briefer, but three reasons it's here. So we might understand how deep the darkness feels. The truth is some of you are very boring characters. I met someone this morning at Phyllis Tree who said, no, I just don't understand depression. I just want to tell people to get on with it, which is very honest and very unhelpful. Uh, but anyway, there may be others here tonight, and that's exactly how you feel. You just want to say, cheer up. Why are you being so grumpy? And basically give them a boot, and hope they'll just carry on with life. Can I say it's not that helpful, but it is how some of us deal with depression. Get a grip, get on. Uh, it's not how God deals with it. Uh, it's not how Jesus deals with it, but it is how some of us deal with it. So if you are here tonight, you're going to resonate with some of this psalm the same way I do. You're going to recognize some of these feelings. But if you're here tonight and praise God, it, you don't have mental health issues and so far so good. Let me just say, it's like saying I'm never going to get cancer. It just simply isn't true. My grandfather never suffered with depression until he was in his 70s and then he did. And he suffered with it on and off the remainder of his life till he died. To say, I don't have this as my problem is naive because none of us knows when our health is going to fail in one way or another. But for all of us, I think it's here so we can get alongside people who are suffering, understand how the darkness feels. But just as important, it's to show us God understands. He really does understand how deep the darkness feels. He doesn't just love us when we're happy. Do you ever feel like God must be more pleased with you when your life's up and together, when you're doing well, when you're full of joy? That must be the moment. Hey, we'll wait to the end of tonight's sermon because my favorite bit comes in point three, which is how do we honor God no matter how deep the darkness feels? Is this in the end, is this despair praise? What do you think? Is this worship? And if it isn't, why is it in the hymn book of the Bible? So can our negative emotions, can our despair even be honoring to God?
That's what we're going to think about as we finish tonight. So most of it's going to be spent on point one, because most of the psalm is about point one. But there are some other things I want to draw out as we finish. So uh, the first and most important thing to begin with is this psalm I think was written so we can understand how deep the darkness feels. Most of it is a description of how darkness feels to He-Man as he's suffering. And he uses three very powerful images to sum this up. He uses the image of being buried alive. That's a very frightening thought for most of us, but that's how he says he feels. He feels like he's being buried alive. He also feels like he's drowning. He uses that image repeatedly and he feels completely alone. So those are the three feelings, like being buried alive, like drowning and being completely and utterly alone. Uh, let's look at each one of those in turn, because I think each one is going to really help us. So in terms of being buried alive, verses three to six, I am overwhelmed with troubles. and My life draws near to the grave. I encounter with those who go down to the pit. I'm like one without strength. I'm set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, who remember you no more, who are cut off from your care. You've put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. So that's the first image there, is of him feeling like he's been buried alive. He feels like he's got no strength left. Verse four, did you see that? I'm like one without strength. And he feels physically weak and emotionally numb. And both of those things are very common in depression. Normal tasks become very, very hard to do. Getting out of bed in the morning if you're depressed is a real struggle. Just the thought of beginning the day, the darkness of sleep or just being in bed seems preferable to getting out of bed in the morning. People often feel permanently exhausted, tired, just doing normal things. And nothing brings much happiness. Things that used to actually give you pleasure just don't do the same anymore. Again, they just feel like too much effort. We feel numb. And so the psalmist there experiences some of that but then goes deeper still. They use the image of drowning a couple of times in this psalm. Look at verse seven. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. And then verses 15 to 17, from my youth, I've suffered and been close to death. I've borne your terrors. I'm in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They've completely engulfed me. Uh, for this one, I have to use my imagination a little bit more. I don't know if any of you have nearly drowned. I did when I was a child, but I was so clueless, I thought I was swimming. So my dad fished me out of the sea and helped me up. I just went, I can swim rather than I can drown. Since then, it's never happened to me. But maybe, I think for a lot of us, we can imagine it, can't we? If you were in a plane crash and you're the last survivor on the ocean, that's how he feels. Struggling in the water with no one else around and just the waves beginning to go over him. Or if a boat sunk, and again, you were the last survivor hanging onto a piece of wood, and the waves are getting stronger and stronger. Um, I remember in our church, Royston Khan, who died this week, nearly drowned a few years back. Um, he was a very strong swimmer, Royston, when he was younger, and decided to go for a swim as an older guy, and he got caught in a current. And I remember him coming out after he got being rescued, and he said to me, Neil, it was like being in a washing machine. I was just being spun round and round and round. I said, I just thought I was going to die. And that's how the psalmist he see, feels. He feels that he is going to drown under the weight of what? God's wrath. He actually feels this is something that God has done to him. Look at the way he uses the word your repeatedly in this psalm. Verse 7, your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. And then in verse uh, 16 as well, your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. He feels in the midst of his suffering that God has done all this to him. And I think when life's hard, we often fall back into that way of thinking. I call it sound of music theology. For those, I'm hoping all of you have seen the sound of music. If you haven't, this is going to mean nothing. Um, but if you have, it might mean something to you. Sound of music theology is this. Do you remember the song? I'm not going to sing, don't worry. Julie Andrews and I don't have much in common. Uh, the uh, song is this. Do you remember the lines? Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my childhood or youth, I must have done something good. That sound of music, theology, you get what you deserve. 
You were a good little boy, a good little girl when you were younger. So as you grow up, good things happen to you. The danger is when we're depressed, we reverse that. And we feel that bad things must be happening to us because we're bad people. And it's most primitive. It's when you miss your quiet time in the morning because you were too busy. And then the day goes wrong. You think, oh, it's gone wrong because I didn't spend time with Jesus this morning. So he's been out to get me all day to remind me I should have a quiet time tomorrow. Not the gospel, is it? But it's the gospel that plays in our heads. And it can be much more serious than that. I remember reading a story once about an elder in a church whose son was dying. And the pastor came to visit him in the hospital. And he said to the pastor, I must have done something really bad. Because God is punishing my son for my sin. Do you see, in those moments, all of our theology... All of what we think we know about God can so easily go out the window and we go back to sound of music theology. When life's sweet, we think God must be happy with me. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. So somewhere in my child or youth, I must have done something good. That's why my children are happy and my job's good. My house roof isn't leaking and life's sweet. And then the roof leaks and you lose your job and your children don't want anything to do with you. And you think God must be punishing me. You know, that's where the psalmist is right now. And it's a horrible place to be. Because in those times we feel down, what we need most is the comfort of God. And yet it's really hard because the voice in our head will tell us, God doesn't love me. You've let him down so badly. You were probably never a Christian in the first place. If you suffer with depression, probably the voice in your head has told you that. That your whole Christian walk is hypocritical. And that you're only getting what your sins deserve because of your hypocrisy. And because you've hurt so many people, now God is hurting you. If you've never been depressed, this is going to sound like nonsense to you. But can I say all the lines I'm using tonight are things I've believed. And played in my own head on repeat at times when I've been down. And so the final image that the psalmist uses here is one that often affects us if we feel down or depressed. Is that we feel completely alone, that no one in the world loves us. He says that here in verses 8 and 18. You've taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. Verse 18, you've taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. He feels completely alone. And so again, when we feel down, we often do feel that. And the voice in our head says, you are completely alone. Nobody loves you and you are unlovable. And then it's only a short step from there to Satan's grimmest lie of all. This world would be a better place without you in it. And once that lie takes root, let me tell you, you are in deep trouble. This world would be a better place without you in it. You see, the point of this psalm is that we would feel the weight of the darkness, of being buried alive, of drowning alone at sea, of being utterly alone, unloved and unlovable. So that when we do feel that way or meet other people feeling that way, we're careful what we say next. How helpful do you think it would be to say to he man here, cheer up. It'll all be all right. God's good. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. It'll be better tomorrow. You see, so many things that we say, God is good. Jesus loves you. Rejoice in the Lord always may be true, but they're like bombs dropped on someone from a great height that do no good in terms of putting their life back together again. What can you do? What could you do? What have many of you done when people are feeling depressed? Come alongside. Sit with someone. Even if they don't say much, just being there is a sign that you care. If they want to talk, then you listen. Don't correct them. Do you see, there's no correction here. A lot of this isn't true. Do you notice that? It's not right. What he says about God isn't correct. But there's no correction here. He's allowed to say these things. 
He can even insult God. Darkness will never be his closest friend. But he says these things. He pours out his heart. And God listens. And if we want to be like Jesus, then we need to be a listening people. We need to be very patient with people in the darkness and not think we can fix them with a single prayer. I mean, maybe the Lord will work a miracle, like once in a while he does with cancer, like once in a while he does with other ailments. I'm not saying it never happens, but more often than not, it doesn't happen, does it? If you pray for someone who's sick, often you'll pray again and again and again. And if someone's got mental health issues, then expect the same. Often it takes a long time when people have come down this low to climb out of the pit. One of my favorite stories, I think, is the story about the guy who fell into a pit. Do you know that story? It's not true. It's a made up story, but it's a useful illustration. He fell into a pit and he couldn't get out. And someone came by with a rope and threw it down and said, come on, climb up the rope. But the guy in the pit was too weak to climb the rope. So he just sat there. Another person came by and they had a ladder. They let the ladder down. They said, climb up the ladder. But the guy in the pit, he was too weak to climb the ladder. A third person came along, looked down and saw the man in the pit. And his heart was moved with compassion. He jumped into the pit. The first guy said, why did you do that? Now we're both stuck in the pit. The second guy said, I've been in this pit. And I know there's a way out and I'm going to help you find it. Too often we want to drop down a rope or put down a ladder. When someone is seriously depressed, what they want is someone who comes alongside. Particularly if you have suffered in that way, know this, nothing you've been through is in vain. The Lord can use you to be such a comfort to others. You can get alongside in the pit and help other people find the way out and know however long it takes, they're not alone. They're not despised and God hasn't forgotten them. Second thing here, I think the second reason this psalm was written was so we might understand how the God understands how deep the darkness feels. This guy, he man was only credited with writing one psalm. Uh, we don't know much about him except he was a musician, because it tells that here, and he was a priest in Chronicles. That's what we know. He had one opportunity to come up with a song. This is his song. The tunes on YouTube are all rubbish. I was looking through this week. There's some cracking sermons, not many with great tunes. I don't know quite how you write a tune for this song, but people have certainly struggled. But ultimately, it's not his song. Who wrote this? All scriptures written by who in the end? The Spirit of God. This is actually God's own psalm. Do you remember what Peter said in his second letter? It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I think that's a remarkable thing to be able to say about this psalm, is that the ultimate author of this is God himself working through him on and his experiences to bring us this song. Behind this psalm is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I love these words by Bible commentator Derek Kidner. He just said, the very presence of these pages in scripture is a witness to God's understanding god knows how men speak when they are desperate that's how much our god understands and knows us how does he know well ultimately he knows because he's been one of us and this psalm was ultimately his song just think about how this parallels jesus experiences in the garden of gethsemane he was crucified and he was placed in a grave while he was on the cross, do you remember darkness covered the whole land? Why did it cover the whole land? Because God's wrath was actually being poured out on Jesus. He was abandoned by his closest friends. And as he died, he felt 
utterly forsaken by God and cried out from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I find that an incredible comfort that when I am at my lowest, when it feels like there's no point living, he knows. He knows. He knows how deep the darkness really is. He knows what it is to be overwhelmed to the point of death. He knows actually what it is to face God's wrath. He knows what it is to be utterly alone. And so in our troubles, he's promised to never, ever forsake us. And when we cry out, he will never belittle us. He'll never turn people like you and me away. I love John Stott's words talking about Jesus. He says, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could we worship a God who is immune to it? I've entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing round his mouth and a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time after a while, I've had to turn away. And in imagination, I've turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow ble bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God forsaken darkness. That is God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. And our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. Which then brings us to our third and final reason why the psalm is in the Bible. It's there so we might honor God no matter how deep the darkness feels. The question is, is this really worship? Why is this in the hymn book of scripture? Why is it there to be sung by God's people when it almost seems to insult him and accuse him of not knowing what he's doing and that darkness is a better friend than God? And yet, what do we see throughout this psalm? We see the psalmist talking to God. Verses one and two, you are the God who saves me. It's a statement of faith right up front. Day and night, I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Look at verse nine. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Verses 13 and 14, but I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why do you reject me and hide your face from me? You see, this is the prayer of a believer, not an unbeliever. This isn't someone who doesn't know God. This is someone who does. It's someone who wants God to act and he isn't. So he's at the end of himself physically and emotionally and spiritually, but he's hanging on in there. He's hanging on in there, and that hanging on in there honors God. See, it's much worse to turn away. I used to be a school teacher, and uh, on parents' evening once, I hadn't realized that I was actually teaching one of the children of one of my spiritual heroes from earlier in my life. And so when this guy came in to see me, I was like, wow, it's this man. And so quickly got through the consultation about the girl's history, you know, boring in comparison. And I just want to say, I said, you know, you completely inspire me. You know, you were so helpful to me when I was a young Christian. The things you said, the things you shared, they really showed me Jesus. And he paused and he said this to me. Neil, Jesus and I are no longer on speaking terms. I don't know what to say. We're no longer on speaking terms. You see, the psalmist is different. The psalmist here is really behaving like Job behaves. Who's he worshiping for? You see, at the end of the day, it's easy to worship a God who gives us what we want, isn't it? The one we have, 
the happy family and the lovely job and the wonderful home. Oh, yeah, praise the Lord. And what does Satan say? Satan says to God, she only loves you because you've given her such a nice life. He only loves you because you've been good to him. Take all of his stuff away, make her suffer, and she will curse you to your face. And what does God sometimes say? Watch. Watch what happens. Take everything. Take everything away and watch how much he loves me. Watch how much she really trusts me deep down when there's no reason to do so, when there's nothing to be gained. And that's what you see in this psalm as you do in the life of Job. You see someone where everything is stripped away, where everything is thrown at this person, where they are utterly beyond breaking points. And still they cry out to God day and night. Still they want to trust him in the midst of gaining nothing from him, of not even feeling him, even their felt needs aren't being met. And yet, and yet they're hanging on in there. And if you had the ears to hear it, you'd hear the applause of heaven. We tend to think God is most happy with us when we are at our most successful. It's a lie. God is most happy with us when we are faithful in the darkness. When there is nothing to be gained. Nothing to be won. When we look like we have failed and have no strength left. When darkness appears to be our closest friend. That's when our father says, that's my boy. That's my boy. That's my girl. And for all eternity, they will be mine. For I am their closest friend. Let me pray. Lord, these are such deep things. And Lord, it is so miserable to suffer. Lord, we thank you that a day will one day come when this will be in the rear view mirror. We won't take Psalm 88 with us to heaven. It'll be a distant memory because we will look upon you and see your smiling face. And all of these things that drag us down will be no more. But we thank you that this side of glory, this side of heaven, you love us so much. You include this in your hymn book. So that when we are at our most broken, when we feel utterly defeated, when the darkness has overwhelmed us and we feel like we're drowning and we can't feel your love, that we can still cry out to you even in the darkness. And in that moment, Satan is utterly defeated because Christ is king. Father, I want to pray tonight for any going through really tough times right now in their mental health. For those who are living in the darkness, Lord, I pray this would be a comfort to them, a strengthening to them, for those caring for them and encouragement for them to bear with. In a sense, we get to walk into Gethsemane and we get to minister to Christ. Help us to do it better than his disciples did. Help us to watch. Help us to pray. Help us to draw alongside those that are suffering. And not to see it as a burden, but to see it as our privilege to stand with them as they battle Satan head on. Thank you for our medics. Thank you for those who care for us. Lord, sustain them in the busyness of this season and the weariness of working in the NHS. Lord, please bless them. And Lord, as a church family, may we be a safe place a place where people can come with all of their burdens and sorrows, with their joys too. And may we know how to love one another as Christ has loved us. For we ask these things in his name and for his eternal glory. Amen.